You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe. Thank you. Chapter 53. Guan Yu frees Huang Zhong in honor of his virtue. Sun Quan fights against Zhang Liao. What Kong Ming wants is for Zhang Fei to agree to the same military law contract that Zhao Zilong has made, the law that makes him culpable if he fails. As Zhang Fei has no problem with that, he signs and soon is on his way to Wuling with his 3,000 soldiers. When news of the impending attack by such a famous warrior as Zhang Fei reaches Wuling, the governor calls his officers to him and starts to discuss the plans for an attack. Only one officer, Gong Ji, argues that this is pointless and that they should submit. The governor is all for executing him on the spot, but is dissuaded by others of his officers. It is agreed that the attack will be led by the governor himself. The attack by the governor of Wuling is an abysmal failure and when the governor flees back to his city gate he finds that Gong Ji has taken over. You brought down the wrath of heaven upon yourself, calls down Gong Ji. We the people have decided to join Shwanda. Arrows rain down on the governor and his retreating troops until one arrow strikes the governor in the face and throws him from his horse. His men cut off his head and bring it to Zhang Fei to win their reprieve. They are followed by Gong Ji, who surrenders the city. In recognition of his role he is made governor by Shwanda. Once again Shwanda reassures the population of a captured city that they will not be harmed. When Guan Yu hears that Zilong has taken Giang and Zhang Fei has taken Wuling, he writes back that he wants to now go and take Changsha. Guan Yu comes to discuss the attack with Kong Ming. The governor of Changsha, Han Xian, is no problem, but beware of General Huang Zhong from Nanyang. He's almost 60, but do not underestimate him. To win you'll need more than the 3,000 troops Zilong and Zhang Fei had, but Guan Yu interrupts him. Why are you trying to discourage me when you praise others? This old soldier doesn't worry me. I won't need the 3,000. I'll take my own band of 500 fighters, and shortly I'll bring you the heads of Huang Zhong and Han Xian. After he has gone, Kong Ming tells Shuanda that he fears Guan Yu will fail, and suggests that they set off after him to offer support, should that be needed. And so it is that Shuanda and Kong Ming also head for Changsha. Now the governor of Changsha, Han Xian, is a vile man, loathed by everyone, not least for his sudden rages, during which he would have people killed, or even kill them himself without warning. When news of the attack is brought to him, he calls in General Huang Zhong. He reassures the governor that he will be able to deal with this threat without any trouble. You see this sword and bow. Well, if a thousand men come, a thousand men will die. When Guan Yu and his men arrive, Huang Zhong rides out to confront him. Challenging him, Guan Yu says, So, this must be General Huang Zhong, to which he replies, If you know who I am, what are you doing invading my lands? I've come for your head, replies Guan Yu, and battle commences. Round after round they fight, but neither one gains an edge. After one hundred sallies against each other, Han Xian calls Huang Zhong back, fearful that his general will eventually be defeated. Guan Yu acknowledges that Huang Zhong's reputation is well deserved. I think the only way I can defeat him is the old trailing sword trick. The next day they battle again. After some fifty to sixty bouts, Guan Yu turns as if to flee, trailing his sword, as the saying goes, and pursued by Huang Zhong. Just as Guan Yu prepares to spring his surprise attack by turning round, he hears the sound of someone falling. Looking back, he sees that Huang Zhong has fallen from his horse. Raising his mighty sword high, he rides towards the fallen warrior, and the shouts out, I spare you. Find yourself another horse, and we will meet again to finish this once and for all. Huang Zhong collects his horse and gallops back to Wuling. The governor, Han Xian, is confounded by this, but Huang Zhong says it is the fault of the horse, who is unused to such intense warfare. But you're a superb archer, says Han Xian. Why didn't you just shoot him? So Huang Zhong agrees to try to lure Guan Yu back to the city walls, and then kill him with an arrow. Mounted on a new horse given especially by the governor, Huang Zhong prepares for the next day, but deep down he is troubled. Is there another man who would have acted as honorably as Guan Yu did today? 
Can I really use such a trick to shoot the man who gave me back my life? On the other side, can I refuse an order from my superior? That night he tosses and turns, unable to resolve this conflict of loyalty and honor. The next day they ride out again, and clash dramatically. After thirty inconclusive bouts Huang Zhong turns and flees, and Guan Yu follows closely behind, intent this time on seizing victory. At the crucial moment when Huang is supposed to shoot Guan Yu, he still cannot resolve his moral dilemma, and so first of all just twangs the bowstring, which at least causes Guan Yu to duck. Huang does this again, and again Guan Yu ducks, thinking, well, he's not much of a shot. The third time Huang notches an arrow, and lets fly. The arrow strikes the top notch of Guan Yu's helmet, and this sufficiently alarms Guan Yu that he turns and retreats while from the walls the soldiers cheer and jeer. Only when he looks carefully at where the arrow has lodged does Guan Yu realize that Huang Zhong has acted virtuously, as he, Guan Yu, acted the day before. In the light of such mutual respect, Guan Yu orders his men to raise the siege. However, all is far from well inside the city, for, the moment Huang Zhong returns, Han Xian arrests him. Why are you doing this? roars the old general. What have I done wrong? For three days I've watched what you've been doing. Do you think I'm an idiot? shouts Han Xian. On the first day you didn't really try. On the second day, when your horse fell, you were spared, which makes me think you have some sort of deal going with Guan Yu. And today, today you fake two shots, and then fire one which just sticks in his helmet. The only explanation is that you're in league with him, and, if I don't have you executed now, you'll betray me. So saying, he summons his guards and orders the execution to take place in front of the city gate for all to see, saying, anyone who opposes me will also die. Huang Zhong has been led outside the city gate, and the executioner has his sword raised ready to strike the fatal blow, when, as if from nowhere, a warrior charges forward. Slaying the executioner, he rescues Huang Zhong and cries out in defiance of the governor, this man is the protector of Changsha, in contrast to that villain Han Xian. What a violent, vindictive, worthless man. He rejects the wise and dishonors the worthy. Let's all go now and kill him. Who's with me? The astonished crowd strains to see who is saying all this. The hero's name is Wei Yan of Yang. He has heard of the valiant struggle of Shwanda to protect the Han, and is on his way to offer his services. He has been unable to locate him so has offered his services to Han Xian. Han Xian thought him a lazy, pointless fellow and basically ignored him, making Wei Yan deeply frustrated and angry. The momentum he has unleashed takes its full toll the next day when, despite Huang Zhong's best efforts, Wei Yan leads a mob who storm the city. Catching Han Xian, he slays him by cutting him in half with a single blow. He takes the governor's head and goes out to offer this to Guan Yu and to surrender the city. When Xuanda and Kong Ming arrive in the city, they are told of the events and go immediately to greet Huang Zhong. However, when Wei Yan comes in, to everyone's astonishment Kong Ming orders his death. Greatly troubled by this, Xuanda questions why he wants to do such a thing. Kong Ming says that a man who will betray his overlord is simply not to be trusted. If we don't kill him now we'll regret it later on, I can tell you, says Kong Ming, but Xuanda will not permit this. If we kill him, why would anyone ever surrender to us again? So Wei Yan lives to fight another day. And Xuanda, now lord of four new districts rich in resources, and with good men on his side, is securely established at last. Meanwhile, Zhou Yu is recovering from his wound while Qing Pu is sent to assist Sun Quan, who is besieging, rather unsuccessfully, the city of Hefei. Hearing that Qing Pu has arrived, Zhang Liao sends a formal challenge, which Sun Quan takes as a personal insult. He decides to go, without any assistance from Qing Pu and his newly arrived troops, to fight Zhang Liao with his own troops. It is a good decision by Zhang Liao. When the two armies meet he makes straight for Sun Quan, but Taishir Si rides to protect him. A side attack on Sun Quan nearly succeeds, but is held off by the loyal officers surrounding Sun Quan. When Taishir Si retreats after a long but ineffectual struggle with Zhang Liao, Zhang charges forward 
and the southern army scatters in disarray. Zhang very nearly captures Sun Quan, and if it had not been for the timely intervention of Qing Pu he would have succeeded. Satisfied with his defense of Hefei, Zhang Liao returns to the city while Sun Quan retreats and watches as the remnants of his defeated army struggle back. His officers remonstrate with him and make him promise not to be so rash again. Not long after, Taishir Si comes to see Sun Quan with news. A groom called Gu Ding has a blood brother in Zhang Liao's army who hates Zhang Liao because he feels he has been unjustly punished for some offense. He is willing to kill Zhang Liao and will signal that night when he has killed him so that Sun Quan's men can then swarm into the city and take it. Delighted with this, Sun Quan agrees that Taishir should have 5,000 men to go with him. When the signal is given, they should force their way into the city. One advisor does suggest that this could well be a trap, but Sun Quan is having none of it. However, what no one expected is that Zhang Liao orders his men to stay fully alert in case of a night attack by the enemy. When questioned by his own men, Zhang says that such an attack is highly likely and reiterates his orders. No sooner has he said this than a fire breaks out and a cry of uprising is heard. Some of the officers are convinced that this is a real revolt, but Zhang says, can the whole city have suddenly decided to revolt? I don't think so. This is some sort of enemy plot. His men start to scour the city, looking for those responsible for the fire. Almost immediately, Gu Ding and his blood brother are captured, and when the nature of their plot is revealed they are beheaded. Suddenly the sound of war gongs and drums sounds outside the city gate and Zhang Liao realizes this is part of the plot. So he decides to turn the plot back on his enemy. Set fire to rubbish beside the main gate and cry revolution, and then open the gate, he cries. When Taishir Si sees the fire, and then hears the shouting and watches as the gate swings open, he rushes in, believing the plot has succeeded. Bombs and arrows rain down on the southern troops. Taishir is seriously wounded, and half of the men die as the northerners hunt them down. It is only when reinforcements rush out from Sun Quan's camp that Taishir is rescued, and the surviving troops are saved. Sun Quan and his men have really no option now, but to abandon the attack and retreat back to their own lands. There, Taishir C.I. dies of his wounds, mourned by all, and Sun Quan adopts Taishir's son, Taishir Heng. The news of Sun Quan's defeat gets back to Shuanda, and he discusses this with Kong Ming. The latter relates to Shuanda that the previous night he saw a shooting star fall to earth in the northwest, which he takes to mean a member of the imperial family has died. The very next moment a messenger brings news of the death of Lu Qi. Shuanda is overcome with grief and weeps uncontrollably. Kong Ming seeks to reassure him. Both life and death are determined by fate. What we need to do now is to plan the funeral and send someone to take control of the city. They decide that Guan Yu should take over Xiangyang, and Xuanda raises the thorny issue that, now the legitimate heir to the city is dead, the southerners can come to claim the city as they have discussed with Kong Ming. Don't worry, says Kong Ming, I know how to handle this. And so it is that, two weeks later, Lu Su comes as an ambassador from Zhou Yu. Now the plan is prepared. The ambassador will return home empty-handed. So what exactly is Kong Ming's plan? Well, read on.